Could we get just by show of hands, how many people here are from Guelph or Kitchener-Waterloo, the region? In other words, not the Torontonians. Awesome. Oh, we're not in Toronto anymore, Toto. So we're here to talk about uh, domestic scale constructed wetlands for wastewater treatment. It's a little different than the normal conversation that happens here. We've been to a couple. Uh, I'm Garrett and... I'm Andrew. That's great. Okay, so we're also going to talk about a specific system that we designed and constructed this past fall. Uh, so this is your favorite topic, I know, septic systems. Um, the old septic system is a septic tank and then trenches in the ground and the ground can be very good treatment. Uh, the septic tank is passively digesting sewage. Uh, but we, um, this really depends on there being lots of oxygen in the ground and the right soil conditions. Um, I'm fascinated by maybe the intersection between septic systems and the more sophisticated ones and then urban technology. So just like photovoltaics on the roof could be um, complementary to your central power station, um, water infrastructure could also help the central water system to, uh, to delay maybe uh, infrastructure uh, capital expenditures. Uh, but today we're going to talk about a purely rural system. So to uh, increase the treatment or to guarantee treatment, um, you may be familiar with some technologies like the EcoFlow PEAT system on the left and then the Waterloo Biofilter on the right. Uh, they're both Canadian technologies and quite successful ones even in the US and uh, Premier Tech behind the one on the left is uh, also active in Europe. Um, and then the whole uh, idea behind wastewater is to get lots of oxygen and to bacteria and to provide habitat. So instead of just aerating a tank, you have habitat by putting ribbons of plastic in the tank. BioNest is also a Canadian technology. So this is, um, we're going to be talking about constructed wetlands today. This is um, one at Everdale Environmental Learning Centre. Um, is the straw bale house that I believe was the showcase home in the 2014 Toronto Home Show and Ben lived in this for a number of years. It's still working. That house has a composting toilet so this is a horizontal flow constructed wetland for the grey water part of it. In the world of constructed wetlands you have on the upper right a, what you think of as a natural wetland with the water that you can see on the surface. Um, and then below that in the bottom right, you can make it more intense by having the water flow through the root zone of the plants. Uh, you can get the most oxygen by dosing it from the top and having it trickle down. So many of the technologies, even the Waterloo Biofilter and Premier Tech are trickle filters. You're applying the water and it's flowing down, picking up lots of oxygen. Uh, this is my bread and butter is uh, larger scale wetlands for things like winery wastewater treatment, brewery wastewater abattoir, landfill leachate. So this is a fine gravel filter and we can recirculate and get it having multiple passes through this, this system. But it does use a lot of plastic and some pumps so um, we're looking at a simpler system for a smaller scale. Um, well that's an example of on the bottom right what it would look like, um, that's for a school north of Sudbury. Um, it's just been planted so you don't see lots of plants there. And Aqua Treatment Technologies is a, a local uh, contractor that builds some of these systems that Andrew yeah. works for. Yeah, they're in, based in Niagara. But we don't do very much under 10,000 litres a day, that's mostly uh, Ministry of Environment scale. I've done a few uh, hybrid wetlands over the year uh, with Fleming College this type of wetland was uh, used at a fish hatchery to treat the water. Uh, but it, it, I haven't done that much in my career because really it's hard when it's not in the building code. It's, uh, you're re relying on a regulator to be interested in what you're doing, which is what Garrett's going to talk about, how interested they are. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> not, uh, it turns out uh, not all of them are all that interested. Um, so in the design process of um, this uh, system, I did a lot of research 
uh, came across a, uh, an example of how North America is often lagging behind Europe in a lot of these alternative systems. This is a, a standard uh, put out by the equivalent of the, uh, the Germany's equivalent of the CSA on planted and unplanted filters for treatment of domestic and municipal wastewater. Uh, and it's written as a prescriptive code similar to part eight of the OBC, so it tells you filter depths and material, grain sizes, etc., to achieve certain uh, treatment parameters. And it's significant because there are no similar documents in Ontario or Canada that describe tertiary treatment of wastewater that you could theoretically build yourself or you know, any contractor could follow these guidelines and, and get that treatment without going with a uh, proprietary system. Um, and these aren't new ideas. These two manuals that I used were written in 1988 and 1994. Uh, the main history of constructed wetlands has been for municipal wastewater treatment. And some of the benefits of, of using a constructed wetland is obviously the advanced treatment of wastewater. Um, it's a non-proprietary technology that uh, theoretically does not require perpetual maintenance <coughs> agreements with manufacturers. Uh, the setup is, because it's custom, it can be set up to your desires so you can have it be passive configured without a pump if the site allows um, and the level of treatment can also be configured to your um, desired uh, needs. Um, the filter media itself is permanent uh, as opposed to some of the other available treatment systems on the market and it also provides a potential habitat for native flora and fauna which is great. And not to be overlooked, they're beautiful and biophilic, and you uh, can... Yeah, this is another project I did for Evolve Builders. Um, and this is, this is a white line on the bottom right, treating full sewage now with a flush toilet. Um, but it, I was improvising at the time, so it really required a regulator to agree to it. And now here's the system we're here to talk about tonight. So this is a sewage system designed for the equivalent of a two-bedroom house um, and you can see there's the uh, conventional portions here the septic tank the pump chamber and the final distribution filter bed and in the middle that's the uh, the unique part uh, and uh, garrett is an artist in revit that's yeah <laughs> amazing all these uh, drawings come from from revit yeah um, it's set up as a two cell system, so Andrew briefly talked about how you can have multiple cells chained together um, to consecutively increase the treatment level. Um, often they're set up with the vertical flow filter first, that's uh, providing a lot of oxygen um, to uh, support anaerobic bacteria. So the water is pumped into this uh, anaerobic fir or aerobic first cell, and the water falls down, trickles over this ledge, and into this permanently submerged second cell. So this is a horizontal flow wetland and uh, the water level you can imagine is around right there. And it's also set up with this bypass pipe for a couple reasons. One that we could imagine having the system operate passively with just gravity flow and it also allows us to test the two cells separately to get data on uh, what each part is, is doing. Um, and here's a, a nice 3D version of it. So uh, again, I love to play with Revit. Here we go again. And uh, th there's a distribution box, sends the water into these large pipes that provide surge volume and e extra aerobic conditions. They're, they're vented from this uh, shared ventilation pipe. And the water then spills over here, uh, maintains a level here as it passes through the filter media. And this little pipe at the end determines the water level in that second horizontal cell. So we've designed the system and now we're hoping to construct it. So we reached out to the AHJ uh, in the region, which was the Leeds, Grenville and Lanark Health Unit. Uh, surprise, surprise, they hadn't heard of constructed wetlands, um, but they were potentially open to the idea. Um, and we submitted in mid-June with uh, an engineer stamp, Andrew's stamp on there. For what it's worth. For what it's worth. <laughs> and we were denied. <laughs> Mid-July, our permit denied. Uh, they said they would not approve any non-BMAC systems. Um, so we considered challenging at the Building Code Commission. 
Um, simultaneously, we realized that the AHJ was uh, undergoing a changeover from the health unit to the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority. And it was kind of confusing who handles this challenge at that time. Um, the timeline happened so that the hearing would be on the other side of the change. Uh, turns out, <laughs> if a building official refuses a permit and it's challenged by the, at the BCC during the, a changeover, the new AHJ is responsible to attend the hearing. So Rideau Valley Conservation Authority is left with the bill. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe they don't, they won't, won't appreciate that. Uh, I, th I wouldn't. Um, and maybe they're more open to the system. So I reached out to them. And it turns out they have a constructed wetland in their office. Um, so great coincidence. And su not surprisingly, they're more open to the idea of uh, an unconventional system. So they said, as long as we have an engineered design and submit a full alternative solutions package, they could see no real issues, and we submitted in early November. And we were approved late November. Oh, that was great. And uh, we were, they did have some requirements for us, uh, like I said, the engineered stamp, Andrew's stamp on there, and full alternative solutions package, and quarterly tests for two years and some drawings that they could I, I also had to inspect it. That's right, I forgot about that. And it has to Which was a nice it. trip to Ottawa almost. Yeah, that was, that was fun. And, uh, and a letter, I suppose. We still have to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so here's some construction photos. So this is the conventional portion. We're just gonna skip through that, but you see the uh, septic tank, the filter bed, that's great stuff. And uh, here is the wetland portion. So you can take a look at these uh, simplified versions up there to kind of get a picture of what's going on. This is the excavated bed for the vertical flow portion and then the horizontal flow portion. And then that's another image of the same thing. You can see that ledge where the effluent spills over and the liner going in there. So both cells are contained in one continuous liner. And that's the collection chamber for the outlet. A collection chamber for the inlet in some eight millimeter gravel. And you can see that bypass pipe going directly to that uh, first collection chamber. Another view. Uh, it, it was cold installing this. I was on the shovel and uh, it's, this was mid-December, early, maybe early December, but uh, it did start to snow at some point. Uh, this is a testing chamber borrowed from the enviroseptic system. And uh, some sand going in there and the pipes, and finally everything's in there, the ventilation system, and this is uh, when it started getting quite cold, but we were ready for Andrew's inspection. So we thought we'd go over some tips uh, for the future if anybody's interested in these systems. So it's important to contact the AHJ early and discuss their openness to these alternative systems, as I'm sure many of you are aware, building uh, alternative systems uh, in other realms. And it's important to have an operator and installer that's open to new ideas, um, as with anything. You want to talk about the, the cost, Andrew? Well, the cost was a little more than a commercial system would be. Um, the main cost of a septic system actually can be the leaching bed, especially in clay soils. But, um, so the conventional EcoFlow was around $25, which is what I'm, I've also found from my commercial systems. Um, and this system was just a bit more than that for yeah. reasons. Yeah. And here are some things I would do differently next time. So reduce the number of sample ports if we're not collecting a bunch of data on a system. Um, I'd experiment overlaying that vertical and horizontal portion to reduce the overall footprint. Um, configure the system without a pump. Obviously, that's great and explore some alternative fill material. And this is an interesting one, trying to use the water for some useful crop growth, some non-edible plants that require lots of water. And another sort of future looking, um, interesting application for these types of systems, as we've talked about before, there are iterations on distributed infrastructure and distributed water. And similar to rainwater harvesting, uh, gray water reuse and or dispersal could have a lot of uh, great benefits in urban environments such as offsetting peak water demands, delaying infrastructure maintenance, 
reducing costs of pumping water all around municipalities. It's a lot of energy going into that and um, potential for irrigation for urban farming. And in Guelph, um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, you can imagine recharging the groundwater uh, supply with um, uh, gray water or some sort of safe treated water dispersal inside urban environments. Andrew, do you have any comments on that? Uh, no, uh, well, driving around here, Guelph is developing in a fairly dense fashion. So, but I, I do imagine dispersal of effluent in common park areas. So that would work well. Right. Yeah. And this is our uh, ties into our next slide here. So, some things that we could imagine in the future, looking forward. So, um, perhaps developing a new standard for non-proprietary tertiary treatment of wastewater. Anyone wants to give Andrew a $400,000. <laughs> um, well, the commercial systems, you know, they do have to spend 400000 plus having their systems tested. And, and maybe these, this non-proprietary thing would have to uh, do the same thing. Um, and if they're claiming level 4 treatment or tertiary, they will probably have to have yearly maintenance and sampling as well. So it's not, it doesn't remove some of the obligations. It's just we are finding some clients prefer some non-proprietary thing. Uh, like the filter bed in part eight is an example of something which is probably very good treatment, but uh, maybe doesn't, is not given as much credit as it should. Yeah, that's right. So uh, another couple of quick notes before we finish. Again, that uh, sending water back into the ground could be very useful. And uh, as Andrew mentioned, imagining sort of communal scale uh, water infrastructure for uh, could inter integrate itself into uh, parks and, and spaces that uh, make the, a city a nice place to live. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, that was great.